This is Chapter 5, Psychopharmacology and New Drug Development. This is the full video of my lecture for the Substance Use Disorder Counseling and Chemical Dependency classes. In this chapter, we examine psychopharmacology, how user characteristics affect the drug using experience, and provide an operational definition of addiction. Other things we will talk about are tolerance, why people may try drugs, and the field of drug testing and new drug development. This video is by David Joe Miller. Some of the material originally appeared on the counselorsoapbox.com blog. Photos are courtesy of Pixabay and Wikimedia Commons and are uh, licensed under the Creative Commons license. A number of user characteristics influence the drug effects and drug using experience. One of those is biological characteristics, genetics. Some people are more sensitive to uh, certain drugs than others. Some people lack the enzyme that is needed to break down a particular drug. Weight is also a factor. More body weight, larger physical size, dilutes the drug more. Age is also a factor. Drugs may affect young children more strongly than people throughout the lifespan. Elderly people may have underlying health issues or their liver may be compromised and as a result they may be affected uh, more severely. Gender is important. Women have more body fat and a lower water percentage. Therefore, water-soluble drugs uh, will hit them more strongly. They'll have a higher concentration of water-soluble drugs in the blood, and they have a slower metabolism of any drug that has any fat solubility. Some user characteristics that influence drug effects are psychological characteristics, uh, whether or not they like the feeling the drug produces. People who are sensation seeking are more likely to attempt try drugs. Having what we used to describe as an addictive personality, which may be a cluster of personality traits. Their expectancies or beliefs about whether the drug using experience will be positive or negative. Social and environmental factors do the people who are their friends or in the culture they're in use or approve of one drug and not another. Set, meaning mindset. Some people are more likely to uh, experience certain effects when they're angry or when they're happy. And the setting where the drug is consumed certainly has a powerful effect on the experience. What are the characteristics of a substance use disorder? What we used to call addiction, and many people still do, though in the DSM, it's now classified as a substance use disorder, mild, moderate, or severe. Well, we've always said that tolerance, that is, after using a drug, it requires more and more of the same drug to get the same effect, or if someone uses the same amount of drug, it has less and less of an effect. And withdrawal, that is, physical or, or psychological symptoms when they stop using, We've always considered these two things as characteristics of addiction, but we've been reminded recently by medical doctors that many prescription drugs exhibit tolerance and withdrawal, and yet people do not break into pharmacies and steal them or develop strong cravings for them. Cravings as the third characteristic of a substance use disorder or addiction have recently been added to this definition. So a drug that shows tolerance, withdrawal, and when the person who is using it is deprived of the drug, they have cravings, meets the criteria for an addictive drug, which is defined as, if they develop a problem, then it's defined as they have a substance use disorder. There are many types of tolerance, and. If you study the textbook, you'll see a wide variety of these described. But for drug counselors, there are three that I think are important to focus on. 
One is behavioral or learned tolerance. The user adjusts their behavior to compensate for the effects of use. Chronic alcoholics will uh, widen their gait in order to compensate for being drunk and still be able to walk. Another thing that's important to look at is cross tolerance. When use of one drug results in a tolerance to another drug, which the user has never consumed before. So the first time users may show a tolerance to a drug because of their past history of consuming other drugs. And selective tolerance, which is when the user builds tolerance to one effect of a drug, but not another. Behavioral pharmacology is the study of drug use as a learned behavior. Reinforcement is a consequence of a behavior that increases future likelihood. You do a drug, you like it. That's positive reinforcement or pleasure. Negative reinforcement is something that reduces the pain involved in using the drug. For many drugs that are highly addictive, the person who uses it goes through a physical withdrawal, which is sickening. That negative pain is a powerful incentive to do more of the drug to stop the withdrawal. Certain characteristics make the drug more addicting. First, you can't get addicted if you don't ever try the drug. Fast-acting drugs, where there's a rapid rush, are more likely to be addicting. Drugs with strong withdrawal effects are harder to quit and therefore more addicting. The route of the administration that delivers the drug quickly and has quick withdrawal is more addicting. Any drug is likely to become more addicting if it's smoked because the small doses raise the level in the brain suddenly, but then crash suddenly, requiring another administration of another dose. As much as drugs have been in the news recently, the drug epidemic, drug overdoses, and so on, it's important to ask the question why people try drugs. Some of the reasons that users give for having tried a drug in the first place is they expect it to be fun. Often a drug is alluring, attractive, or has an exciting image. It may be recommended by the doctor or by peers, and they have positive expectations. It's interesting when working with teenagers or children, parents often say, oh, the reason they did drugs was bad peers or uh, because they were depressed or were having problems in school. When you ask those same children, teenagers, why they tried it, because it sounded like it would be fun and exciting. Another psychopharmacological question we need to ask is, do animal tests predict drug effects on humans? I know the research community has been somewhat divided on this issue, but it's important to consider why we see these news articles that say a new drug has been invented that does such and such, and then the drug never reaches the market because it proves ineffective when tried on humans. So do rats and humans react the same way? Well, there are many similarities which allow us to test drugs on small animals like rats and mice. Uh, addiction potential is usually the same between humans and say rats. The dose per pound or per kilogram of body weight is the same. Effect based on age, young and old, are, uh, rats are likely to react the same way as young and old humans. And we can test for the presence of other drugs in the body, combinations, to see how they act. There's been some testing in rats and mice uh, on pregnancy, because certainly if a drug uh, adversely affects pregnancy in a rat, we wouldn't want to test that in the human. But there's some important differences between animal testing models and the way humans react to the very same drug. Human body system are much more complicated and our brain has a lot more parts, layers that have grown out around the outer part of the brain. This means that psychiatric meds, central nervous system drugs, Alzheimer's drugs often appear to work on a rat or a mice 
a mouse who has memory problems or some emotional uh, condition response. But when given to a human, these same medications don't seem to be helpful. Uh, there was one editorial written by the person who was at the time the director of the National Institute of Mental Health about why sometimes the mice get it wrong. The other difference is that mice and rats are dependent on whatever dosage we give them. Humans can often alter the dose. An addictive way of thinking is that, that one pill is good, 30 must be better. So it's common for humans to either not take it, not take it on a regular basis, or to take more than the prescribed amount. One of the things that happens when new drugs are introduced is they're often uh, tested and they're compared to placebo-controlled drugs. People's beliefs about the drug they are taking heavily influence the results. Uh, let me give you an example. Let's say that we discovered a new smart drug which we thought would improve students' scores. And we were to give this to two classrooms. One would take the real smart drug and the other would take a, a sugar pill, something with no active component. During the course of the semester, lots of things are going to happen to the students in both classes. There will be some students who come in and, and we ask them to keep a journal of daily uh, results from taking the med. Some will come in and report that that day they had felt constipated. Others might feel that they had diarrhea. Some people would report that they were really drowsy and sleepy that day. Others would say, oh, I couldn't sleep last night. And during the course of the semester, would we expect some students to develop respiratory symptoms, flu or colds? Well, those things would happen. What we would need to know at the end of the testing was, how did the rate of constipation or diarrhea compare with the people who were taking the real medication versus taking the placebo that had no active ingredient? Some of the research you look at does, shows many, many side effects of taking a drug, but the rate of those side effects is not much higher than for the placebo or for the active medicine than for the placebo. Other times, the rate of these side effects are extremely high. Another issue we have is the, the issue of the placebo and nocebo effect. If the researcher knows which is which, the way they talk to patients will influence the patient's uh, feelings and attitudes. So in a double blind test, not only are the people taking the medication, uh, not knowing what they're taking, whether they have the active or the placebo, the doctor who's prescribing it and who's administering this drug may not know whether it's an active ingredient or a brand uh, new test drug or whether it's in fact a placebo. This ensures that the results are really the result of the drug and not people's expectations. Let's look at some cases in which people's expectations will alter their report of which med works best. If we were to give a group of test subjects medications and then ask them how well it worked, which do you think would work more effectively, pills or capsules? The majority of test subjects will report that the capsules work better. Which do you think people will believe works better, white capsules or colored capsules? The majority of people will report that colored capsules work better than white capsules. Which capsule will work better, a one color or a two-color capsule. Most people will report that a two-color capsule works the best. Does the name of the medicine on the package influence whether people think it works or not? Most, though not all people, will report that medications whose name includes the letters X, Y, or Z works better, presumably because it sounds more like a scientific chemical compound. 
There are a number of ways in which new drugs are discovered, both new pharmaceutical drugs, prescription meds, and new street drugs. Chemicals are often found in nature, in plants or animals or other uh, natural occurrence. Some of the new discoveries come from reviving old folk remedies and discovering that the herb that someone, grandma's great grandma was using actually does work. Sometimes, however, drugs, new drugs come on the market because of an accidental discovery. For example, a case of a new cholesterol drug. It was used to treat people in a random trial and didn't turn out to be particularly effective. The drug didn't work for treating high cholesterol. But during the course of the trial, some people with high cholesterol are really depressed. And those depressed people taking the new cholesterol uh, medication recovered from their depression. Result, the drug, instead of being marketed for treating high cholesterol, was tested and eventually released for treating depression. As we have more and more medications, and we know their formulas, it's possible to create computer programs that then generate a list of new compounds that haven't been tried in the past that are likely to act in the same way that the current compounds do. Sometimes these new compounds turn out to be more effective for treating a specific variety of an illness. Let's walk through the stages of a new pharmaceutical drug's development. There will be preclinical studies, and if those studies show any kind of promise, the company that's doing them will file an application for an investigational new drug. One thing they're looking for is an orphan status. If a company is able to find a drug that treats a disease or condition for which there is no accepted treatment, that gets fast track, it gets reduced fees and lower standards of what's needed to do to get it approved. So developing a new drug is encouraged if it's going to target a condition or illness for which there is no current treatment. Once that investigational new drug application has been approved, they can begin phase one studies. These are safety studies. And what they do is begin with a, a small dose and gradually raise it until there are some problems with it. And then they say that's the most they can use. Notice in the preclinical area, often these drugs have been tested on uh, lab animals, rats, and mice, even before the company filed for the investigational new drug uh, permission. Once the phase one safety studies are done, phase two would be small efficacy studies. Does the drug at the proposed dosage really work and really accomplish anything? There can be phase 2A and 2B, depending on the size of these samples and a dosage escalation and so on. Once the drug seems to work and work in a reasonably large sample of people, it moves to phase 3, which is a large study. And in this study, the drug would be compared with another approved drug or a placebo. Uh, the company would look for adverse reactions and how much dosage was required to be effective. If it passes through this phase three study successfully, they would file for a new drug application. Uh, I noticed that several of the texts I have on my shelf don't include these steps that are in the blue type here. After the new drug application uh, has been filed before the Food and Drug approves it, there is typically an advisory committee on a particular area. Scientists or doctors who work in that field will look at the drug, say, does the research say it worked? And is the safety adequate? And is it an improvement? And the advisory committee will recommend approval or not. Of course, uh, the government doesn't have to listen to the advisory committee, but strong for or against recommendations typically uh, decide the fate of that drug. And sometimes the advisory committee says the benefits of a new medicine are not worth the risks. But if the drug is now uh, available, uh, 
passes this advisory committee and is approved, it moves into the next step. Uh, a lot of books leave out the fact that there will be a manufacturing approval. Right? right now the world is in turmoil and we don't know where this is going, but many of the drugs in the United States have been manufactured in China or India. Result, we actually have American inspectors who have to go and physically look at these factories to see that their manufacturing is actually producing a safe, pure product. Recently, we've seen that uh, a lot of problems with certain uh, antacid medications or heartburn medications that had contaminants that weren't expected. Assuming the manufacturing plant or process is approved, the drug is released either prescription or maybe later on uh, after years of use as an over-the-counter med. There is with new drugs, prescription drugs, aftermarket follow-up. Anytime a doctor experiences an adverse effect, they are supposed to report this and those reports go from them to the company back to the Food and Drug Administration. Too many adverse reports about someone taking a particular medication can result in a review of that medication and even that drug being withdrawn from the market. Some other factors to keep in mind. Investigational new drugs are only approved for use in a registered clinical trial. Someone who has an illness for which there's no treatment may want to go to the government websites and look to see if any um, hospital or other in agency is testing a new drug for their problem. Sometimes they have to travel a long way to get enrolled in these new drug trials. I've mentioned before orphan drug status. Uh, there's a much expedited process when there is a disease for which there is no treatment. The first company to get that drug approved has relatively lower hurdles. Once that drug is approved, all future medicines for that orphan disease uh, now have to show that they work better than the first approved drug. There's also the question of indications. Many drugs are tested only with adults. Doctors can use it off-label with children, but it may be so expensive to test a drug on a large group of people that uh, the company may not test it on children or they might not test it on people with uh, diagnosed uh, depression. So many of the drugs have indications only for one or two things, but may in fact, in fact be effective for other things. And doctors may sometimes prescribe drugs for things that are not indications or not listed on the label as a uh, use. Generic drugs are another development in the area of pharmaceutical chemicals. Assuming everything is done correctly, they are the same chemical formula, but since brand name drugs are patented and at higher prices to help the company recover the costs they spent going through that process of approval, once those uh, approvals, of that drug has run its course and the patent is out, uh, then other companies can begin to make generic versions of it. So it should be the same chemical formula, should be a cheaper price. It's usually made by a different company, although I've seen a couple of cases of a, a manufacturer of a brand name product later on coming out with a generic version of their own brand name product. Uh, but one of the big differences between generic and brand name drugs may be the, the fillers, the things that are needed to make the product big enough that you can get your hand on it and swallow it. Many uh, medications, the majority of that tablet you swallow is in fact fillers made so that uh, the size is big enough that you can pick it up and swallow it. Sometimes these fillers or the ingredients used may be less biologically available so they don't digest as well or don't produce as high a blood level. Sometimes for some people it does not work as well. So there's a procedure that if you're prescribed a generic drug and your insurance company pays for it because of the cost savings, but for you the fillers produce bad results, adverse effects, 
or it doesn't work as well, your doctor can seek approval to continue to prescribe you only the generic drug. There's a new development. Some drugs are now manufactured by a biological process, and the process can be patented. So once they have that, other companies can't use that process. There's a new uh, development there called biosimilar, in which other companies come up with a different process for processing and developing, growing, manufacturing that same drug, a different chemical reaction, and they can get up their biologically similar, biosimilar drug approved as a generic version of that original uh, drug. So what is some of the terminology that applies to chapter five, the psychopharmacology and new drug development? I, a note here, some of these words may not appear in this chapter, but since they're words that may appear in test questions about the material in this chapter, I always include the words that I think you should know after reaching this point in this class. Tolerance can be acute, behavioral, dispositional, functional, or cross tolerance, reverse tolerance, and another type of tolerance I didn't mention here in this video is protracted tolerance. Some additional terminology, addictive personality, which we talk more about in the section on treatment. And in fact, drug counselors take uh, 36 units at a, the college at which I teach. So they see the addictive personality theories looked at in other classes. I talked about things that are reinforcers, punishers, positive and negative reinforcement, about the use of a control group, brand names versus generic drugs, the placebo effect, and definitely we've talked about and we'll talk more about the idea of cross tolerance. What are some of the really big ideas you should have learned from this video and from this section in the book? The effects of drugs depend on the user's characteristics and those characteristics can include genetics, age, weight, gender, mindset, setting, and probably a number of other factors. We talked about the characteristics of addiction or a severe substance use disorder, and the definition, our working definition, is that a drug that produces tolerance when there is withdrawal, when the drug is stopped, and for which the user develops cravings the presence of tolerance, withdrawal, and cravings indicate addiction. We've talked about selective tolerance and cross tolerance, both of which are important concepts for the drug and alcohol counselor. 